All good? Please start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Sainsburg today. So I'm going to talk to you about the AES practical work, specifically the exam, um, the exams for physics, chemistry, and a bit about biology. So I've come from three different sides. Firstly, as a teacher, I want to share with you what's in the syllabus, what you need to know in the syllabus. Then as a exam supervisor, we have run the exams for Cambridge. So give you some insights into what to expect in the lab. There's lots of things that happen on exam day, not just for the crack exams, but for even your written exams that maybe parents um, don't know about or they aren't privy to. And even students, after an exam, they're not sure what went wrong or what really happened. There's so many uh, emotions that you're going through. There's so much of uh, stress that um, things go wrong and you can't really um, explain what, what went wrong. So I'm gonna try and give you some insights into what happens on the exam side in the exam room so that you can better prepare for that. And the third part I'm gonna to come to you from is as a chemical engineer to give you some insight into why we do these practice and how it can help you in your future studies um, if you wanna go and study beyond your AS level. Okay. So the AS exam is compulsory to our exam. Okay. For physics, chemistry, and biology, all two-hour exams. Uh, differences between them is that the biology is two questions, and you get roughly an hour for each question. So you spend an hour on one question, you swap over, and you work on the other, the other questions. You still have your paper with you for the entire time. So you can continue answering all the questions. You just won't have access to the equipment. You have access for, to your microscope for approximately 55 minutes. And after that, the next batch of students switches over and they use their equipment. Similar situation for physics. So you've got two sets of equipment. It's laid out on a desk like this. And you've got your... Um, Equipment for question one on one side, equipment for question two on the other side. You spend an hour with each set of equipment and then you switch over. Now, it doesn't matter if the center has more equipment available. I find this a lot in exams with students. They done with one set of equipment and they say, well, can't I start with the next question? There might be equipment available. Maybe there's extra desks available you have to spend an hour before you switch over. That's just to ensure that everyone, uh, that this is fair, no matter what center you, you at, you don't get an advantage from being at one center versus being at another center. So the one hour, but you still have your paper with you so you can work on both questions for the entire two hours. Just your equipment that you have limited access to. The, Chemistry paper, there's two or three questions, okay, depending on the length of the questions. You get a qualitative analysis question, so it's iron analysis, identifying different um, chemicals, and then you get the quantitative analysis that could be one or two questions. So things like titration, gas collection, uh, enthalpy, rate of reactions, that kind of questions. And depending on the length of the question, it might be one or two. So for example, a reaction rate question takes a long time to complete. So in those, those situations, you just get one question and your um, qualitative analysis. The, um, in order in which you do the questions, it's up to you for chemistry. Um, for physics or biology, it will be decided for you you will be placed either with the microscope for your first hour or you will be doing your other questions for your first hour and then you swap, swap over. There's no choice 
there's no real um, advantage to doing any of those questions first or, or second. So um, it, it shouldn't make a difference uh, at all to you. Okay, so to first understand why this is such an important paper, it's about 21% of your total mark for AS, but it's more important than 21%. It can be really your best chance of pushing up your grade. Your paper one is your multiple choice, your paper two is your structured questions, your paper three is your practical paper. Your paper two is probably going to give you the fairest reflection of uh, the level that you at. Your multiple choice, I find students often um, perform lower than their paper two. The multiple choice can be very tricky, but for a number of reasons, uh, students may perform worse. The multiple choice is your last paper. You might find you writing it a long time after you've finished all your other papers. So students have kind of had enough of the studying then. They've, um, they, they struggle to keep up the intensity right up to the multiple choice paper. Your practical papers will be written earlier, so your chance of performing well and getting a really high mark in practicals is much better than your multiple choice. So you really need to use that opportunity, put in the best effort you know, that you can for that paper so that you get started on a good mark and then you carry that through um, to your other papers. Okay. Um, students usually negative about the practicals because they haven't had enough practice. Um, and this goes back to IGCS. So I want to position this, uh, where we do, why we do these practice and what the rationale um, for doing this practice at AS, the exam at AS is. At IGCS, we introduced to the entire syllabus, all the topics. Um, at AS, you do some of those topics, so some of those topics are carried through and the rest are completed at A levels. So you find that your IG level is the time when you can explore the entire service. You get introduced to all the topics. At AS, we are more um, testing your knowledge, but in a much more structured way. And there's not time to explore your interests. So your practical skills that you learn at AS is more for you to understand it from a, a means of answering questions that you have developed at IGCSE. And if you haven't had exposure to enough practical work at IGCSE, you don't have the questions that you want to test. So the practical sessions are often um, you don't understand where it fits in, they often not of interest. So give me an example, we have, we might have a track where you're just bouncing a ball and measuring the height that you bounce the ball. Okay. So the work you're doing at AS, it's not about the actual uh, question that you're investigating. It is about the technique you're using to investigate the question. We're expecting you to have the questions. So we don't give you interesting questions. We're not trying to um, you know, push you in a certain direction. We want you to have developed these questions, be curious about things from IGCSE. Now we tell you how you can go and explore those questions deeper. So how you can set up a prac, so plan a prac, how will you come up with an, an experiment to test your question that you have and then how will you analyze the data? And then finally, what conclusions can you draw? So you will learn about an analyzing data, about designing a track, as well as learning from the data in terms of how could I change the track? How could I change this experiment? How could I make it better? Now, all of this is quite pointless if you don't have any questions that you want to answer. Okay. So if you have not gone through this at IGCSE, if you don't, haven't formed an interest in certain phenomena that you've experienced, that you've observed, then learning about how to do it 
is, is not of much interest and students lose interest in science and at that point they uh, maybe decide science is not for me I, you know this is, is um, a lot of just exam prep and I'm just studying for the exam I want to put more and it affects your future decisions about it, you know following a career in, in science but if you do this well if you start the way the Cambridge system is designed you start early on observe making observations about the world around you coming up with questions that you have and then what's missing is the technique to go and investigate those questions then you understand where the AS uh, part fits in so we had this conversation in class the other day talking about maybe any question that you might might have um, picking a golf ball seeing which which golf ball works best for your golf swing. Okay. So that might be a question you have, and now we're saying, okay, how do we go about testing this question? How do we go about gathering data? How do we go about analyzing the data? And can we find a correlation that might be useful, that might be something that we want to explore further, and from that you decide what you want to do um, with science further along. It doesn't just have to be scientific, it could be looking at numbers on the stock exchange, any data sites, but these are the skills that you learn. So we deliberately don't do interesting cuts. If you look at the past exam papers, they're very straightforward because it is to remove the attention from the crack itself and put the attention on the technique that you, you're learning. So when you look at it in that context, you pay more attention to what Cambridge wants. They want to see that you can do the prac in a very reliable way, in a disciplined fashion that's repeatable. So if we give the same prac to 10 students, we can get data that we can put together and uh, draw conclusions from uh, repeatable, reliable data. So there's very little room for you to be creative, to put your own spin on things. That happens at IGCSE. That's when you come up with your question. Okay. Now we want to see that if you do the prep or another student does the prep, we can expect the same answers. We can expect the same way that the answers are displayed. We don't have to guess about what the student did and what the data means. So you get marks for drawing tables you get marks for um putting your units in, in the correct uh, way you get marks for um making observations in a way that's repeatable that other students will make the same observations that's what the as level is about so this is also where students um struggle they do the prep well and they answer things in a way that they feel is their personal interpretation. And they don't get any marks for it. Because what Cambridge want to see is that you can produce it as almost in a robotic fashion. That's reliable, that we can trust the data, and that if you make changes to the pack, we can see the um, improvements to those those tracks. So that's the big um, downfall of many students, that they treat paper three as if it's a paper two. Paper two, it's your knowledge and your understanding. So you get to answer questions and you can give your own interpretation um, and you'll get marks for it. You will not get the same marks for paper three. Paper three is strictly about sticking to a method sticking to uh, terminology that everyone agrees upon um, so that the data can be assimilated from many students. So you have to treat it differently. You have to treat your paper two question very differently from how you would answer in, in paper three. The um, day of the prep, it's a long day. So it's a two hour paper, 
but you don't prepare for two hours. You should prepare for four hours or even five hours of endurance. You start the day leaving home, getting ready for the pack. You're going to arrive at the lab a lot earlier than you get to start the pack. Um, there's a lot more students doing tax exams in November than in June. So in June, you may there might only be one session. So let's say there's 20 students at an exam center. They will all write the pack at the same time. In November, we have many more students. So we split that into multiple sessions. But you've got to wait for the other session to finish their work. Or if you go in first, you have to wait afterwards for the other group to get started and there's a key time after which you may leave. So there's a long process that you go through. And I see this in the exam room specifically with uh, physics tracks. The physics track, you can finish with quite a bit of time to spare. Now, it doesn't mean you just give an extra time not to do anything, but you can get your data quite quickly and students start to get impatient. So they've been waiting a while, maybe two, maybe three hours, till they get to write their paper. Now they've got to do their question one and they've got an hour. And they finish it early. And when they get to question two, they rush through it. Over and over, I see the students rushing through question two, making mistakes because they just can't pay attention anymore. They just can't concentrate anymore. It's a long day in, in waiting and waiting for the, the lab. So they make mistakes or they don't complete the questions uh, with the same detail that they would had they been uh, focused on, on the work. You don't find this with chemistry or biology because the time gets filled up. You, you almost need all your time just to finish the class. You still have enough time with chemistry or or biology, but you won't have a lot of time to spare. With physics, you have time to spare because Cambridge expect you to repeat tests. So if you need six data points, students do six sets and they're done. They're done, they draw the graph and they are finished with it. Okay. And they lose many marks because of that. But what Cambridge are giving you the time for is so that you can Analyze your data and they have to repeat tests that don't fit the trend. So you can draw a straight line graph, and if you find your points are out of a reasonable uh, precision, you expect it to repeat those, those tests or you lose marks. And that's what you've got the timing for. But students get their six data points. If it's all scattered on the graph, that's it. They, they are done. They don't have the energy to go back and do it again. So the best way to, um, to fix this is to practice following the trend in the table. As you're taking the readings, check for the trend. So practice looking for a trend in the table as you're recording your measurements. Uh, it's going to be a straight line, either going up or going down with the negative gradient. But there's going to be a clear trend. Students only see the trend when they draw the graph. And by then it's too late. They probably used up their time now and they have to swap over and move on to the next question, to the next set of apparatus. So it's too late to do that. You rather check your data as you're recording it in the table. So if you need to repeat something, you do it at the right time. You can always draw the graph later. Even if you've swapped over, you have enough time to draw the graph then. But don't rush and try to finish a question and then only later realize your data doesn't look that good and you can't go back and take take new, new readings. Okay, so you have time, you have two hours, specifically for physics, for, for all the papers, you have two hours that you need to use well. You need to use your entire two, um, two hours, okay? It's a exam that's very different from any other exam. Normal written exam, you come in, you sit at your desk, you don't talk to anyone, you don't turn around, you don't look at anyone, and you complete your paper and that's, that's it. 
in the practical lab, you will find that you have to walk around the room. Okay, so try and picture this. You have to go and weigh things, you have to go and wash things, you may have to go and uh, collect some, some new uh, um, chemicals, and you might share equipment with another student. And all of those things, you are free to, uh, to walk around the room. So you can imagine there's other students sitting around working on their work. You can walk around, you can see exactly what they're writing as you pass their desks. You, um, and that distracts students. The other thing that you can see is you can see exactly how they do in the practice. And that starts to become a problem. So I see students that maybe start their prep well and see other students around them doing something different. And they change what they're doing. They doubt themselves and they think, okay, the colors of chemicals I'm getting doesn't look like the colors that the person next to me is getting. And they chuck out their batch of um, experiments and they start doing it again. So doubt creeps in. The other thing that is distracting is that a student might be having a discussion with the supervisor. Okay. So this, there's a supervisor in the room who um, is the science teacher or the scientist that's there to assist. And then there's other invigilators that may or may not be science uh, teachers. So your help is going to come from the supervisor. If you ask for help from an invigilator, they may not be able to assist you. They may just go and call the supervisor to help you. So the supervisor may be having a discussion with the student and the other students start to listen in on the conversation. And then they want the, the, the clock is still ticking. So you find that if you're not prepared for these distractions, you start running out of time. Because every time there's a distraction, you stop what you're doing and you start listening in on the conversation. You see what other students are doing and you start to change your, your plan. And the only way you can counter this is to have prepared well. If you prepared well in a lab, then you would have worked in a lab with lots of other students doing lots of other things and you've been able to focus on uh, your work and not what other people are doing. You're confident about what you're doing and that's the best way uh, to, to do it. Okay. The, um, the beginning of the crack, you meant to read through the entire question, okay? read through the paper, understand everything you need to do in that pack. Even though it's going to take up a bit of time, it's going to save you time later on. If you don't read through the crack completely, you may start something only to realize later on that there was a mass you're supposed to record, there was something you were going to do, and now you need to start. Uh, again, so read through the whole pack. It helps a lot with the calculations. If you read through it, you know exactly where they're going with this question. And later on, when they ask you certain things like um, for errors, problems with the pack, errors, you're already ready with those answers because you know what's coming. So when you're doing the pack, you are mindful of those, those things that you need to pay attention to. But that doesn't happen. As much as we prepare students for that, you get students in the lab and they will start reading and all is good. And they see a whole batch of students stand up and start going weighing, weighing things. And they start to panic. They think, okay, everyone is weighing, I'm falling behind. I'm not ready now. And I'm still reading. So they stop what they do. And they grab what everyone else has. Maybe they need to weigh something and they go and stand in the queue to wait. And you find students standing in a queue to wait for 10 minutes because other students are using the scale. Now, the equipment like scales and the wash basins that are shared, um, that's the same in every exam center. It's not like, okay, this is a poor exam center, we don't have enough balances. There's a fixed number of balances that you set out for the number of students. Um, so it's the same, it's fair no matter what center you at. So if you want to stand in the queue, you're just going to waste your time. You have to learn how to multitask. You need to know that 
if I need to waste something, I'm going to put a placeholder on my table so that I remember I need to wait. But I can continue with calculations. I can continue with other work. I can continue with the other questions till I see that the, the balance is available for me to go do my, my way. Okay. So don't go just stand in a queue because you see everyone else has started that question. You need to know all the questions. You need to know um, which one you're going to start with and how you're going to multitask. That's really what's going to save you um, in uh, save you time. So, for example, your um, biology question, there's, you can start with the, the, the second question, even if you don't have the, the equipment. There's a lot of this data given to you. It's part of the question is like an alternative to crack. So you can start on that even if your one hour is enough. So you don't have to do your first question and then sit around for the end of the hour before you start with the next question. Same thing with uh, with uh, chemistry. You can multitask. You can start drawing your um, tables. You can start uh, running your qualitative analysis in between your other questions. So learn to multitask. With chemistry, you have with all, with all of these. You, with chemistry specifically, you have all your equipment right in front of you. There's no diagram usually that tells you this is the equipment you need for question one, this is the equipment you need for question two, this is the equipment you need for question three. So you need to know the type of crack you're doing and exactly what equipment is required. So if it's a gas collection, you need to know exactly what equipment do I need for that crack. If it's a titration, you need to know what equipment you need. It's not going to be laid out for you that this is what you need. So there again, students start mixing up the equipment. If you haven't had the experience in the lab, you see what the person next to you is doing and you try and follow that. Or you've seen something on YouTube and you think that's gonna be fine. It may be fine for you to pass. You may get away with it to pass. But remember, we try to get the highest mark possible for the track paper. That's your best chance of your three papers, that's the paper you can score the highest. So you want to get that advantage to assist you in paper one and paper two. You don't want to just scrape through your paper three because you're already putting yourself under pressure to perform really well in the multiple choice. And the multiple choice is going to be uh, tricky. With your physics paper, you even get dummy equipment put in front of you. So this is equipment that's not required for the crack. And they do give you diagrams there. So once again, what they try to see is can you follow, follow, can you follow the instructions strictly, diligently? So they give you a diagram and they want you to set it up exactly like the diagram. Even the description of how you set it up isn't clear. They want to see that you are going to follow that diagram. Whenever there's a doubt, and there will be doubt on how to use certain, how to put things together, that you are going to follow the diagram and set it up. And if there's equipment in front of you that you haven't used, you need the confidence to leave it and know that I don't require that for this crack. It's not going to be detailed. They're not going to tell you exactly what you need. You need to follow those in instructions. Even if the person next to you or in front of you is doing something something different. So that's really important that you have that confidence that you are going to stick to your plan and not be distracted by what else is going on in, in the room. Uh, another thing that students do struggle with sometimes is safety equipment. So things like goggles, if you do biology, to wear gloves, and they haven't practiced that, and you require to use it in the, in the lab, and they struggle with safety goggles, for example. When you're doing your practice, please wear your safety equipment so that it's not a, you know, it's something awkward that you're experiencing for the first time in the exam, which is the worst time to to try it, try it out. Um, also, on the day of the practice, parents have a big role to play. Okay, so let's let me give you a scenario, quick scenario here. We've got the supervisor and maybe the other science teachers that's been preparing for these, these practice. So you have to prepare the, 
chemicals the day before. Some of the stuff for biology you prepare the morning um, before the exam. So they've been busy for quite a while um, getting this lab ready. They may have multiple sessions to plan for. Okay, so they've got to plan the room, who's going to come in, who's going to sit where, according to many variables that they have to consider. Um, not least among them is concessions that students get. So a student might be getting extra time, a student might need their own room. Um, all of those need to be catered for. So you've got to trust that the center is doing what needs to be done so that every student has the, a fair chance of completing the practical exam. Parents want to come in and discuss with the supervisor they want their child to do be part of the first session and everyone wants has different requirements. Maybe they're writing another paper in the afternoon or whatever the case is, please get all of that sorted before the exam day. Make contact with the exam center, make contact with the exam officer, discuss these things. The day of the prep is not the time to come in and start uh, discussing anything. If there's a certain concession, make sure the center is aware of it. They probably are, but you just want to have those channels open between you and the center, that they know who you are or who your child is, and they know any um, what concessions they need that you know which session they're going to be part of so you can plan accordingly. Okay. If you arrive on the day and you find your child is only going to be in the second session, or, uh, that's being planned according to the total needs of all the students. Um, it can't be changed just on, on the day. It's going to be more disruptive um, to the whole, whole setup. The supervisor is going to open the papers with all the students present and has to write the exam along with the students. So that's different from a written paper. You don't get the invigilator having to write the exam. That's also going on in the same time. So the supervisor has to assist students while doing the experiments themselves. They do it out of sight of all the other students, but they do it at the same time so that they can verify that everything works. There's no problem with the chemicals, for example, or any equipment. And their, mark, their, their results become the, the, the master data. So your student's data is going to be marked against the supervisor's data. So it's really important that um, their planning gets supported, that there's no conflict between the parents and the exam center on the day of the exams. If anything needs to be sorted out, please try and do that uh, before the, the exam day. Um, the shared resources, just from a safety point of view, please sanitize yourself. The equipment is not going to be sanitized after everyone touches it. You have to make sure that you sanitize yourself after you touch anything. Okay? The equipment that gets shared may not be at the setting it should be at. So I've seen this in exams where you need to use a scale and a student maybe before you in the queue has pressed a few buttons and the settings are, are off. It's not on grams anymore, maybe it's in calibration mode or something. And students just go there, put their uh, sample on the, the scale and take the reading. Okay. The onus is on the student to know how to use the equipment. You have to check that the equipment is there, that it is at the right setting. Um, if there's any doubt, stop, check with the supervisor, and then continue. The center is not responsible to check the equipment after everyone uses it. The student must know how to use the apparatus. Things like multimeters for electricity plugs in physics. A student might use it before you, might be bored, might start to switch settings. Okay. The, be, between sessions or, or as they switch over, the supervisor will check the equipment. Okay. 
But if you know there's any doubt, make sure you draw the attention of the supervisor to it, ask and make sure that everything's at the right settings um, before you take all your readings and then only later realize that something's not right um, and, and then your, your prep is, is ruined. Okay. If you need more materials, you can ask. More chemicals, anything, more equipment, you can ask. If you're doing electricity and you want to need more uh, electric leads, you're free to ask for, for that. Okay. If there's something that you think isn't working properly, you can always ask the supervisor to check it. And if they find that it is indeed faulty, they will give you extra time. They will replace the equipment and give you extra time. So rather be safe, it may take you a minute to call the supervisor and ask. But if you're in doubt, if you've got a stopwatch and the stopwatch doesn't want to work or you're trying to stop it and it doesn't stop, just get new equipment. Don't struggle with it and then later say, well, I struggle with the crack because um, my stopwatch wasn't working properly. If you have an objection, all you'll get is you get another chance to rewrite the exam in six months' time. But you're not going to get any marks because your equipment was uh, was faulty. There's a whole procedure for that. If there's breakages, if there's something that went wrong, the supervisor will write to the examiner and they will decide on, on uh, what needs to be done. But the supervisor's job is to try and make sure that every student completes the practice. If they need to give you extra time, if they need to change equipment, whatever intervention they need to do, the, the plan is to try to get everyone to finish the practice. Not to write a report and say why we couldn't do the practice. That's not going to help anyone. You're still going to have to do the practice at some, at some point. Okay. Leave the equipment the way you found it. At the end, put it back in the settings that you found it and leave it there. Um, when you're taking any readings, a good tip is to carry your answer book with you. Don't trust that you can go to the scale or uh, get a reading and come back to your desk and write it. Many times students switch the numbers around, they forget the reading they, they took, or they write something incorrect and later find out it was a mistake. Carry your paper with you at all times. Go to the scale, take the reading, write it in the block, create a table for yourself so you know what readings you need to take and write it down. You may not be able to take all your readings when you need to, but make a block or a table for yourself so you know exactly what readings you need to take. Maybe there's something that you've heated, you've got to wait for it to cool, you aren't going to sit there and wait for it to cool for five minutes before you go and wait. You need to go and do some other work on another question in that time. But you must make sure that your table clearly shows that you need to take that reading. So when you come back to it, you're not unsure of what is missing, what you need to do. You're not reading the question again. It's clear there, you set a table for yourself so you know, okay, that's what's missing, that's what I need to, to take. So, Take your sheet with you, fill in the data immediately as you take your reading. That goes for using a calculator as well. No matter what calculation you're doing, as simple as it may be, please don't do it mentally. Please punch in the numbers in a calculator, even if it's a simple calculation, and um, use the calculator to, to do the working for you. Very strange things happen when you're under pressure and you've got many things going on around you and you make mistakes with the calculations and it affects your, your work. Okay, so the multitasking is really important. You've got to set up your desk in a very ordered fashion so that you can do multiple experiments without knocking things over. You've got enough space, use the space. But also keep your chemicals or samples um, in an ordered fashion. It's very easy to mix up acids and bases and maybe you need the acid in the burette and you mistakenly put the 
face in the period and now you need to go wash the whole thing out so keep things separate have nice order on your, your desk so that you can run multiple tracks at the same time and this takes practice it's not something you can just decide on the exam day this is how i'm going to lay it out you need to reuse equipment from one experiment to the next and biology you need to wash equipment and reuse it so it needs to be in an ordered fashion use droppers i see these students using droppers they forget which dropper is which they mix the wrong chemicals together they get the wrong results those are little housekeeping things that only come with the practice you must lay out your space well use the space in front of you and know exactly what you're working on that you're not going to knock anything over and that you um, don't mix your equipment droppers um, chemicals that it's going to not be contaminated your booklet always have some paper towels with you in your pocket right at the beginning if you knock something over so you can clean it up quickly that it doesn't fall on your exam paper um, or that you um, you have very messy students because they haven't been practicing they leave a lot of uh, liquid on their desk things are spilling they're washing they're not drying and they've done a lot of work and they place the exam paper on the water or on the acid or whatever you need you know liquid is on the desk and just like that everything is ruined now that's not the fault of the exam center that's not the fault of the supervisor that unfortunately means you're probably going to have to do the press again all you're going to get is a fresh answer for clips okay those are important things those are small things but they're important and come with practice setting up your desk multitasking keeping track of what you're focusing on what needs to be done and the best way to do it is to set up your tables beforehand don't rush off to go and start the practice because everyone else is starting it go through your answer booklet draw your tables underline what measurements you need to take make little notes for yourself so that when you start you know exactly what you need to do even if you're starting 10 minutes after everyone because you've taken that extra time to plan your strategy of which question you're going to do when you're going to do it and um, what readings you need uh, to take it saves you a lot of time when you're doing the calculations to know what you're planning for what are you heading for what questions are going to get asked uh, later later on so any problems you experience the supervisor will, uh, if you experience that and they assist you, they will write in their report. So you can get assistance from the supervisor. They will record the assistance they will write you. In physics, they may even set up your apparatus for you. If you're having difficulty, you can ask the supervisor for assistance. But know that they will write it in their report to the examiner. And the examiner may decide whether to deduct marks because of the assistance you receive. It depends on the type of assistance uh, you, you receive. If there was something faulty and they had to replace it and give you extra time, you're not going to be penalized for that. But it's still going to be recorded in the in the examiner in the supervisor's report. If there's assistance that you need in setting up your equipment, and I find this is probably more likely with electricity tracks. With any other physics track, you get a diagram of exactly what the equipment should look like. So there shouldn't be any reason why you can't set it up like that. So you've got um, a picture, you've got the equipment in front of you, and you can set it up according to the picture. It's different with the electricity tracks. In electricity tracks, you're getting a separate diagram. So you need your knowledge of your symbols your electrical uh, component symbols to be able to read that diagram and set up the, the circuit. So if you're not familiar with that, that's maybe where you might need the supervisor to come and set it up. So at least maybe you lose a mark or you lose two marks, but at least you can do the rest of the question. The other 18 marks of the question, you can continue. So if you're stuck, 
If you're not sure, maybe that's the time you want to ask for assistance. If you ask for assistance and they, um, they may uh, advise you in a certain way that you don't need the assistance, you, uh, you know, you're not sure about something, they're not just going to penalize you. They're not just going to write it in the report. So, for example, if you're unsure about a piece of equipment or you're unsure about the setting the multimeter should be on, you're absolutely free to ask, and they need to confirm and show you which setting it needs to be on, and that's not included in the report. You're obviously not going to be penalized for that. You're only going to be penalized if there's something you meant to know and you um, don't know it and you need assistance. So the difficulties experienced by all the candidates, so sometimes all candidates might experience difficulties, um, maybe a certain chemical that not react the way it should. And remember, the, the supervisor is only seeing the, the questions at the same time as you. So they haven't had the privilege of running the experiment before that time. So if they pick up there's an issue, they may intervene, they may change something, and they will give everyone extra time to complete this. Because remember, we want to get everyone to finish the tracks, have a fair chance of completing the tracks. That's the best way for you to be assessed, and you won't be penalized uh, for that. Okay. So how do you get this track experience? Best way is to attend a school or a center where you have access to a lab, and you going through regular going to regular lab classes. You want to do this at IGCSC. And because this you don't have to write a practical exam at IGCSE, practical work is often neglected. And as I mentioned, if you don't start this work at IGCSE, the AES work seems quite pointless and boring to you. And so does a career in science later on. Not because you're not interested in it, but because you don't understand why you need to do something that's so boring or so point, pointless. Okay. But if you start at IGCSE with whatever practical experience you can get, the main idea is that from the syllabus, from your observations, you are coming up with questions that you're curious about things that you want to know more about, and then the practical work falls into place. So if you're not at a school, there's track workshops. Uh, maybe it's a few days that you spend in the track, in the, in the lab, and you get a crash course in, uh, in, your, in your lab work. So that's your second option. Third option is to do it at, at home, where you get a kit, and you set up the experience and as best you can supplement it by whatever videos uh, you can, can watch and that may be good enough to get you to pass but you've got to decide you know um, give yourself the best chance to get a high mark in practical work in physics it's if you do it well you can completely get 100% because the paper, the format of these papers is exactly the same every year. You're not going to get another paper where you know exactly the style of questions, exactly the format that, that you're going to get it in. Um, so you want to score well in these. You have every chance of scoring highly in that. With the um, reason for doing this tax, which is to test your theory and your question or come up with your own theory, you don't want to bring in your theory into the prep work. The two are different. So if they give you an equation, let's say an electricity equation, and it doesn't match what you learned in theory, don't try to bring in your understanding into the prep work. The prep work is for you to perform the experiment, show that you can use the equipment, show that you can record the data reliably, consistently, repeatedly, and be able to um, identify errors and improvements in that track, also to be able to plan any new track. It is not 
for you to link it with your theory. Okay, so remember, it is about your question you're going to have or your theory that you're going to come up with, not something you learned in the theory class. So don't mix the two. Okay, you don't need your theory. The exception to that might be in your qualitative analysis or um, chemistry, where you may, when you need to identify certain chemicals, you may need to identify organic chemistry, chemicals or organic molecules. And your understanding of organic chemistry there is very useful. So color changes to understand, identify a functional group, you will need to understand how an alcohol reacts or how carboxylic acid reacts or an aldehyde. And there's a few experiments there. So don't forget about those. Generally, there's a list of experiments you need to know for identification, but you also need to know your organic molecule identification. It doesn't happen often, but you can get those questions. In the exam, you are given a sheet for chemistry with your uh, iron tests and gas tests. For your anions, I suggest you memorize that, you learn that, because your practical work can also get question in paper one and paper two, in multiple choice and in the structured questions. Um, you could get a question on color changes, on uh, reaction observations in any of the other two papers. So you still need to know what reactions can occur, what could you observe and what the observations uh, mean, even without the sheet given, given to you. Okay. Um, you can practice further with dummy data. So if you've got a uh, practical that you've got, that you can do um, from a past paper, put in some dummy data, practice doing the calculations. There's two things that you get from that. You can be able to predict better what range of results are reasonable. Let's say you're doing a titration, you get to predict what values are um, expected, what range is expected, and then be able to do your calculations quickly. Your calculations carry the most marks in your uh, exam. So your calculations are going to count for much more than the experimental work. So students are coming to the lab or do the practice well and come out feeling confident that I've done the prep well, I'm going to get a good mark. That was a good exam. And they're quite shocked when they see the marks because they did, got good results. Everything went smooth. Now, for um, different tracks, there could be varying uh, ratios of marks for the practical work and the um, calculations. For titration, for example, you might get one third of the marks for the doing the practice accurately and two thirds for the calculations and being able to record it uh, consistently. For something like gas collection, you actually may get no marks for doing the practice. Well, and that may seem strange, but if you think about gas collection, you are collecting gas in a measuring cylinder, and you have a full view of everyone else in the center. If you turn around, no one stops you from turning around. If you're walking around, you are seeing what everyone else is, is seeing. So coming up with a value, a, a volume, is not going to count for any marks because you can see this from everyone else. What you do get marks for there is being able to do calculations and identify changes to the experiment, improvements, problems with the experiment, uh, understanding the, the process, but not for the pack itself. So you have to pay attention to answering the, the questions. So that's really important when you look at past papers, put in dummy data, come up with your own dummy data to see whether what you think is reasonable, what you think is should be acceptable in the practice, 
from your understanding and reading of the track is actually what um, you see in the, in the marks here, that you can do the questions quickly. Rather repeat a past paper than doing multiple past papers. Do it many times. After you've seen the mark scheme, this increases your speed. It also helps you to give your answers according to how Cambridge wants it. If you do a paper once and you look at the mark scheme and you say, okay, I see what I did wrong, I see what they want. The next time you write those answers, if you do another paper, you're going to make the same mistakes because you are going to write it the way you think you are thinking um, of, of describing your answer. You are not going to write it the way they want. The only way you're going to do it is if you do the same paper multiple times. I know it's painful to do the same paper multiple times. Do the paper, look at the mark scheme, do the paper again. Until you find that the way you are reporting the results and observations is matches the mark scheme. You don't want to do it like paper two. Paper two, you will get benefit of the doubt. The examiner is looking to see whether you understand um, the question and you know the answer. Not whether you can write it exactly how they want it. So they will judge from your, your way of writing it, whether you understand it. They will give you the benefit of the doubt if they judge that you must have known an art of that a certain concept, even if you didn't write it down. That's not the case with practicals. With practicals, you must write it down the way they want it. And you will see in the mark scheme, they will give you the answer. They will also give you answers, alternative answers, where you will not get a mark. So maybe you will, might use the phrase effervescence, or you might say bubbling, or you might say gas produced, and they will detail there which is the correct phrase to use. You might say no reaction, or you might say uh, no visible change, and they will specify the mark scheme which is the correct phrase that you need to use. If you don't use that, you don't get the mark. You may have done the track well, you may know the work, you may write down what you've seen, but because you haven't done it in the way they want it, you are not going to get the mark. And that's where there's this, um, when you come out of an exam and you think you did well, and you feel everything went smoothly, yeah, but you know. your marks don't um, match match that. Okay, so um, your uh, gas tests, anion tests, all of those you can get tested in your paper one and paper two as well. So you want to um, learn that learn that. Okay. Also, when you're looking at other students' work as they're working through the. Um, Exam in the exam room, you can see the data. So, how does that prevent cheating? Now, you'll be given different masses of samples, and the examiner will have an expected result for each mass. So, they will work on a certain ratio. So, if you walk past the next person and you say, Okay, they look like they knew what they were doing, I'm just going to take their number and write it down on my sheet okay. and we have experienced this in the exam where your answer matches the mass that the person next to you was given because the examiner gets the seating plan as well so you've got to do focus on your answers for your work and uh, the masses that you've been given rather than just looking around at what everyone else is, is given so um, the examiners will not assist you with any observations or any measurements. If you're not sure of a color and you want to confirm and ask the examiner, the, the supervisor, is this blue or is this purple, they aren't going to be able to assist you with, with that. But there's, um, the, the, the marking is quite lenient because different people see colors differently. Um, maybe the smells are different. So there's quite a big you know, leeway in terms of your observation. So they're not going to be strict about the exact color that you see. They want to see that you have reported 
and certain observations, specifically with things like, like, uh, like colors. Um, with your uh, dummy data and drawing graphs specifically, you want to be able to practice that uh, maybe with Excel. You've got to draw best fit curves and that kind of thing. Now, your judgment of the best fit curve may not match their judgment. Because what they're checking is, um, is there a better way? Is there a better answer that, or a better um, uh, graph that they could have drawn? And so you may not get the marks for that. So the best way to test this is to use a spreadsheet program like Excel, take your data, punch it into Excel, and get Excel to draw the best fit line for you. Okay? And then match that to what you judged as, as the best fit. So that's a great way to get better at your judgment of best fit curves. Um, and when you draw your, your line, I suggest using a clear ruler. So get a 30 centimeter clear ruler. You see students coming in with a small 15 centimeter ruler and trying to draw a line. And they end up drawing a few uh, points. There's a, a, a broken line and they join another part of the graph. Get a 30 centimeter use ruler, preferably a clear ruler. It really helps with you to judge the points because you can put it over all your points and move the ruler around and see exactly where the best line is going to be. You want a balance of points above the line and below the line. And that's best done when you can see all the points all the time. Um, you want to use a sharp pencil, preferably a clutch pencil, so that you can draw your points, small, small crosses, so that you can see your points, but they're not too big. They're not more than a half a small square. Practicing drawing graphs, picking your right scale, can save you a lot of pain in the exam. Um, don't um, just look at your data and neglect practicing the graphing. Okay. Um, students pay a lot of attention to getting the data and lose a lot of marks, straightforward marks, because they haven't practiced doing graphs. They haven't practiced that, they haven't, um, they miss certain pointers. So that's more important than the prep itself. There's more marks for things like tables and graphs than the track itself, which means you must spend that um, an, uh, a large amount of time doing those things. Once again, this all seems quite pointless and painful when you are measuring how high a goal points is. But if you have your question from IG and you have testing this and you want to see the data, then the data is of interest to you. The graph is important to you because you're answering a question that you have, something you're curious about. So that's really where you have to tie in this at the IG level. It really, it, it makes all this less painful um, and more meaningful. And I cannot stress that enough. The, um, there's no time for fun at IAS level, unfortunately. Cracks we do are designed to help you in the exam. The techniques you're getting are there for you to answer your own questions, okay? not for you to find an interest in the prac itself. So there's no time in the syllabus to explore different phenomena. That must be done at IGCS. That's why the syllabus is much broader at the IGCSE, you experience the full breadth of the, the subject and you can find things that interest you, things that are cu you're curious about, and you can do this experiment without having to focus on an exam. You're doing it because you are curious about the question. And only later you are filling in the technical part, which is at AS level. So the practice you're doing at AS level 
is really you're going to find there's very little time to explore things that are of interest to you. That's something you should be doing outside class. There's very nice citizen scientist programs that I suggest my students join. Um, they're almost as important as your grades when you are applying to universities, when you apply to a university, or for a job later on. It's what things have you been interested in? So many citizen scientist programs where the data is available online and you can join a program and they give you the tools, but this is where your skills at AS become critical. How to analyze data? Can I trust the data in the data? Are there any correlations? What variables do I need to keep constant? What variables were changed? And is there a theory that we can um, we can develop from from this data? So that's where you take this to the next level. You take it into your citizen scientist programs that's of interest to you. That's going to count as much as your grade. University acceptance, um, bursaries, jobs, anything, and it helps you decide also the things that are of interest to you. It's going to assist you in deciding your tertiary studies. That's the best use of the skills that you're learning at AS. We are not trying to force a certain uh, part of science or uh, area of science on you. We are just giving you the tools that you can apply in any area of, of science. Most students will finish in time. We do see students that are struggling with the apparatus. Um, and that's not the time to learn it in the prep, but most students will finish in time. The marks they lose is because they mess up the calculations and the questions not the experiment. The experiment is not going to be the, the problem. They have not paid enough attention to the calculations. Chemistry, simple things like um, reacting masses and volumes. Chapter one of the syllabus, students rush to do that because it's familiar to them from um, IGCSE, and they want to get through the syllabus as quickly as possible, so they neglect it. Chapter one is your most important chapter in the syllabus. It might seem strange, but I get my students to spend more than a month on that chapter because it gets tested in the facts, gets tested in paper two, gets tested in paper one. Without that, you are not going to get um, half your marks in, in the practical paper. Not just understanding it and being able to do it, but be able to do it quickly. So if you struggle with time, it is not because of the prep it's going to be because you're struggling with the questions and the calculations and you haven't paid enough attention to that or spent enough time on that. Even if you don't get through the prep and you use your first estimate, you can get most of your marks from doing all the questions, provided you have spent enough time preparing for that. Okay. Um, how do you write up your results is really important. This is going to be, um, you, you need, it's not just a space for you to do your rough work. Okay, so your uh, space there is the way you communicate to the examiner. So you want the examiner to follow your thinking and your work. And they ask for you to clearly show how you do things. Whereas many students use it just as a means to scribble down their calculations or whatever raw data they've got so they can punch it all into the calculator and put one final answer there. If the examiner cannot follow this, your thinking and your working more so for um, paper three than paper two, um, you are going to lose marks. Remember, it is reason for this is that many students can do the same experiment and we can trust the data from many scientists. We can bring all this data together and know exactly what you do. There must be no doubt, it must be clear what you did, which data you used, where you got your gradient, what significant figures you used, clearly communicated to the examiner who's going to be the scientist that has given you 
the, the work. Okay. And the time that you use, use it well. Plan your work. Repeat work if you need to. Um, write down as much as you can so that you can come back and, and check this. Uh, if you have time to check this, you can. You have your paper with you for the entire two hours. So work on multitasking and getting your data done. Clearly, the same for paper two. Write down all your working. It really helps when you come back and you need to check your work. You don't have to read through the question again. It's not a matter of just taking you to all the numbers in your constant calculator. There's a big calculation and wrote down an answer. Every step has been recorded, which makes your checking easier. And this is what will assist you further with your A levels, which is just a continuation here. So at A I, IGCSE, you are coming up with the questions and the ideas by being exposed to all the different phenomena around us. At AES, we're giving you the tools to be able to do the track and produce data and analyze data. And at A level, you will be able to design your own track, plan and design your own uh, track that um, you or someone else can, can do. Okay, that's it from me. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Let me just check. Uh, give me a second. Some any questions? No? Okay. No questions. I think we're good. I hope that was of use to you, some of it, and all the best to you. Thank you.